morning boys and girls, um, ready for the next chapter in our Ozma of Oz. So I remind you where we are. Right now Dorothy is being held captive by Princess Langwider because she won't give her her head. Princess Langwider keeps 30 heads and she changes them depending on her mood. Um, TikTok has wound down and can't move and Valina's been put in a hen house to lay eggs and if she doesn't lay eggs the princess intends to drown her so that's where we are right now everyone's kind of stuck the next chapter is called Ozma of Oz to the rescue so we're finally going to meet Ozma today and we're going to see how she gets Dorothy and TikTok and Belina out of their troubles Nanda brought Dorothy bread and water for her supper, and she slept upon a hard stone couch with a single pillow and a silken coverlet. In the morning, she leaned out the window of her prison in the tower to see if there was any way to escape. The room was not so very high up when compared to our modern buildings, but it was far enough above the trees and farmhouses to give her a good view of the surrounding country. To the east, she saw the forest with the sands beyond it and the ocean beyond that. There was an even there was even a dark speck upon the shore that she thought might be the chicken coop in which she had arrived in the, at this singular country. Then she looked to the north and she saw a deep but narrow valley lying between two rocky mountains and a third mountain that shut off the valley at the further end. Westward, the fertile land of Ev suddenly ended a little way from the palace and the girl could see miles and miles of sandy desert that stretched further than her eyes could reach. It was this desert, she thought, with much interest, that alone separated her from the wonderful land of Oz, and she remembered sorrowfully that she had been told no one had ever been able to cross this dangerous waste but herself. Once, a cyclone had carried her across it, and a magical pair of silver shoes had carried her back again. But now she had neither a cyclone nor silver shoes to assist her, and her condition was sad indeed. For she had become the prisoner of a disagreeable princess, who insisted that she must exchange her head for another one that she was not used to and might not fit her at all. Really, there seemed no hope of help for her from her old friends in the land of Oz. Thoughtfully, she gazed from her narrow window. On all the desert, not a living thing was stirring. Wait, though. Something was stirring on the desert. Something her eyes had not observed at first. Now it seemed like a cloud. Now it seemed like a spot of silver. Now it seemed like a mass of rainbow colors that moved swiftly toward her. What could it be, she wondered. Then gradually, in a brief space of time nevertheless, the vision drew nearer enough for, to Dorothy to make out what it was. A broad green carpet was unrolling itself upon the desert, while advancing across the carpet was a wonderful procession that made the girl open her eyes in amazement as she gazed. First came a magnificent golden chariot, drawn by a great lion and an immense tiger, who stood shoulder to shoulder and trotted along as gracefully as a well-matched team of thoroughbred horses. And standing upright within the chariot was a beautiful girl clothed in flowing robes of silver gauze and wearing a jeweled diadem upon her dainty head. She held in one hand satin ribbons that guided her astonishing team, and in the other, the other, an ivory wand that separated at the top into two prongs, and the prongs being tipped by the letters O and Z, made of glistening diamonds set closely together. The girl seemed neither older nor larger than Dorothy herself, and at once the prisoner in the tower guessed that this lovely driver of the chariot must be that Ozma of Oz, of whom she had heard so lately from TikTok. Following close behind the chariot, Dorothy saw her old friend the Scarecrow, riding calmly astride a wooden sawhorse, which pranced and trotted in as naturally as any meat horse could have done. Then came Nick Chopper, the tin woodman, with his funnel-shaped cap tipped carelessly over his left ear, his gleaming axe over his right shoulder, and his whole body sparkling as brightly as it had ever done in the old days when she first knew him. The tin woodman was on foot, marching at the head of a company of 27 soldiers, of whom some were lean and some were fat, some were short and some were tall, but of all the 27, there were, were dressed in handsome uniforms of various design and colors, no two being alike in any respect. Behind the soldiers, the green carpet rolled itself up again so that there was always just enough of it for the procession to walk upon in order that their feet might not come in contact with the deadly, deadly life-destroying sands of the desert. 
Dorothy knew at once it was a magic carpet she beheld, and her heart beat high with hope and joy as she realized she was soon to be rescued and allowed to meet, greet her dearly beloved friends from Oz, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, and the Cowardly Lion. Indeed, the girl felt herself as good as rescued as soon as she recognized those in the procession, for she well knew the courage and loyalty of her old comrades, and also believed that uh, any others who came from their marvelous country would prove to be pleasant and reliable acquaintances. As soon as the last bit of desert had passed and all the procession from the beautiful and dainty Ozma to the last soldier had reached the grassy meadows of the land of Ev, the magic carpet rolled itself together and entirely disappeared. Then the chariot driver turned her lion and tiger into a broad roadway leading up to the palace, and the others followed while Dorothy gazed from her tower window in eager excitement. They came close to the front door of the palace, then halted, the scarecrow dismounting from his sawhorse to approach the sign fastened to the door, that he might read what it said. Dorothy, just above him, could keep silent no longer. Here I am, she shouted as loudly as could she could. Here's Dorothy. Dorothy who? asked the scarecrow, tipping his head to look upward until he nearly lost his balance and tumbled over backward. Dorothy Gale, of course, your friend from Kansas, she answered. Why, hello, Dorothy, said the scarecrow. What in the world are you doing up there? Nothing, she called down, because there's nothing to do. Save me, my friend, save me. You seem quite safe now, replied the scarecrow, but I'm a prisoner. I'm locked in, so I can't get out, she pleaded. That's all right, said the scarecrow. You might be worse off with little Dorothy. Just consider the matter. You can't get drowned or be run over by a wheeler or fall out of an apple tree. Some folks would think they were lucky to be up there. Well, I don't, declared the girl, and I want to get down immediately and see you and the Tin Woodman and the Cowardly Lion. Very well, said the Scarecrow, nodding. It shall be just as you say, little friend. Who locked you up? The Princess Langwider, who is a horrid creature, she answered. At this, Ozma, who had been listening carefully to the conversation, called to Dorothy from her chariot, asking, Why did the princess lock you up, my dear? Because, exclaimed Dorothy, I wouldn't give her my head for her collection and take an old cast-off head in exchange for it. I do not blame you, exclaimed Ozma promptly. I will see the princess at once and obligate her to liberate you. Oh, thank you very, very much, cried Dorothy, who, as soon as she heard that sweet voice of the girlish ruler of Oz, knew that she would be, she would soon learn to love her dearly. Ozma now drove her chariot around to the third door of the wing, upon which the tin woodman boldly proceeded to knock. As soon as the maid opened the door, Ozma, bearing in her hand her ivory wand, stepped into the hall and made her way at once to the drawing room, followed by all her company except the lion and the tiger. And the twenty-seven soldiers made such a noise and clatter that the little maid Nanda ran away screaming to her mistress, whereupon the Princess Lang Rider, roused to great anger by this rude invasion of her palace, came running into the drawing room without any assistance whatsoever. There she stood before the slight and delicate form of the little girl from Oz and cried out, How dare you enter my palace unbidden? Leave this room at once, or I will bind you and all your people in chains and throw you in my darkest dungeons. What a dangerous lady, murmured the scarecrow in a soft voice. She seems a little nervous, replied the tin woodman. But Ozma only smiled at the angry princess. Sit down, please, she said quietly. I have traveled a long way to see you, and you must listen to what I have to say. Must, screamed the princess, her black eyes flashing with fury, for she still wore her number 17 head. Must to me? To be sure, said Ozma. I am the ruler of the land of Oz, and I am powerful enough to destroy your, all your kingdom if I so wish. Yet I did not come here to do harm, but to rather to free the royal family of Ev from the thrall of the Gnome King, the news having reached me that he is holding the queen and her children prisoners. Hearing these words, Lang Wider suddenly became quiet. I wish you could indeed free my aunt and her ten royal children, she said eagerly, for if they were restored to their proper forms and station, they could rule the kingdom of Ev themselves, and that would save me a lot of worry and trouble. At present, there are at least ten minutes every day that I must devote to the affairs of state, and I would like to be able to spend my whole time in admiring my beautiful heads. Then we will presently discuss this matter, said Ozma, and try to find a way to liberate your aunt and cousins. But first, you must liberate another prisoner, the little girl you have locked up in your tower. Of course, said Langrider readily. 
I had forgotten all about her. That was yesterday, you know, and a princess cannot be expected to remember today what she did yesterday. Come with me, and I will release the prisoner at once. So Ozma followed her, and they passed up the stairs that led to the room in the tower. While they were gone, Ozma's followers remained in the drawing room, and the scarecrow was leaning against the form that he had mistaken for a copper statue, when a harsh metallic voice said suddenly in his ear, Get off my foot, please. You are scratching my polish. Oh, excuse me, he replied, hastily drawing back. Are you alive? No, said Tick-Tock. I am only a machine, but I can think and speak and act when I am properly wound up. Just now my action is down, and Dorothy has the key to it. That's all right, replied the Scarecrow. Dorothy will soon be free. Then she'll attend to your works. But it must be a great misfortune not to be alive. I'm sorry for you. Why? asked Tick-Tock. Because you have no brains as I have, said the Scarecrow. Oh, yes, I have, returned Tick-Tock. I am fitted with Smith and Tinker's improved combination steel brains. They are what make me think. What sort of brains are you fitted with? I don't know, admitted the Scarecrow. They were given to me by the great Wizard of Oz, and I didn't get the chance to examine them before he put them in. But they work splendid, ma'am, splendidly, and my conscience is very active. Have you a conscience? No, said Tick-Tock. And no heart, I suppose, added the Tin Woodman, who had been listening with interest to this conversation. No, said Tick-Tock. Then continued the Woodman, I regret to say you are greatly inferior to my friend the Scarecrow and to myself, for we are both alive, and he has brains which do not need to be wound up, and I have an excellent heart that is continually beating in my chest. I congratulate you, replied Tick-Tock. I cannot help being your inferior, for I am a mere machine. When I am wound up, I do my duty going just as my sh machinery is made to go. You have no idea how full of machinery I am. I can guess, said the Scarecrow, looking at the machine man curiously. Some day I'd like to take you apart and see just how you are made. Do not do that, I beg of you, said Tick-Tock, for you could not put me together again and my usefulness would be destroyed. Oh, are you useful? asked the Scarecrow, surprised. Very, said Tick-Tock. In that case, the Scarecrow kindly promised, I won't fool with your interior at all, for I am a poor mechanic and might mix you up. Thank you, said Tick-Tock. Just then, Ozma re-entered the room, leading Dorothy by the hand, followed closely by the Princess Langwider. All right, so that was a pretty easy rescue. Um, Princess Langwider's number 17 head is kind of flighty, I guess, and even though she was really angry at Dorothy yesterday for not trading heads with her, she forgot she even locked her in the tower the next day. So it wasn't much of a rescue. Ozma just said, let her go, and she said, okay, I will. So she did. All right, well, wonder how Ozma intends to rescue the royal family of Ev from the Gnome King and if Dorothy will help her in that endeavor. Um, think about it. Think what you might do if you were trying to rescue the family from the Gnome King. We haven't met him yet, so we don't know what kind of person he is, what kind of character he's got. So he might be really easy to deal with or he might be really scary. We'll just have to see. The next chapter is called The Hungry Tiger. Dorothy hasn't met the tiger before, so this will be her first time meeting him. I um, wonder what he's hungry for. Would a hungry tiger make you nervous? I think it probably would me. All right, well, we'll see you guys tomorrow for the next chapter, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Bye.